Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caitlin Henry, and I'm a professor here at Sonoma State. And we're very excited to have folks that have joined us already for this session. And uh, we will go until 5 o'clock. We will have 45 minutes of discussion between former state senator Mark Leno and between uh, our dean, Hollis Robbins. And we'll take 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. I know there's a lot more people who plan on joining us and, and will join us later. We are recording this to post on our website. Social Justice Week is in its seventh year. It's a student-led initiative that uh, we host in the School of Social Sciences. And the students came up with the rules you see behind me this year for interacting. So they uh, came up with the rules to be courteous to others and avoid inflammatory language speak from your own perspective, criticize ideas, not individuals, no derogatory or hateful language or actions, avoid speaking over each other, respect other people's contributions, and step up, step back. So at the beginning of our sessions, we did a land acknowledgement, and I will also post that in the chat. And at the end of the session today, we'll ask you to fill out a survey in order to keep our funding. So I will turn it over to Hollis Robbins, who's going to facilitate the conversation for 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Caitlin, and thank you for organizing our Social Justice Week in our sixth year, sixth year. Um, and this is, I know people will be trickling in slowly because it's a Friday afternoon, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to many more joining us. Um, and I'm so delighted today to have Mark Leno joining us. Um, I've been a fan of Mark's for many, many decades uh, and very excited to, had following his career um, uh, from the Board of Supervisors or the, yes, Supervisors to uh, the California Assembly to the State Senate, um, where he was a groundbreaking uh, figure and um, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, first of all, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And one of the, even though we probably won't spend a little, a lot of time here, is so delighted about your journey from uh, rabbinical school uh, to a small businessman into public service. And since so many students uh, always think about like, do I have to decide uh, at college, what I want to be when I grow up? Do I have to make the decision now? What what am I going to do with my major? Is my major the appropriate major uh, for a career and what I want to do? And what I, what's so delighted about your path, uh, Mark, is that you, I mean, did you know how you were, where you were going to end up and how you were going to end up, uh, I'll call you Senator Leno, uh, how you and knew you were going, how you were going to end up uh, serving the uh, state of California and our citizens? Dean Robbins, let me say thank you for the invitation today. And I hadn't stopped to think when I accepted it for late Friday afternoon that we might be competing with a few other interests at that hour <laughs> of the week. But nonetheless, I'm very pleased and honored that everyone who joins us today is joining us. And again, thank you for this invitation. And just want to say how fortunate San, uh, Sonoma State University is to have you in your office because you bring so much scholarship and academic accomplishment, as well as your heartfelt interest in your student body. Uh, to the chair in which you are currently sitting. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you. And also just tip my hat to your social justice week of conversations and presentations. It's a, a, a terrific idea. And I'm only learning as we go that this has all been student inspired and student driven and makes it all the more exciting. And I don't think we could imagine that there's any more or better time uh, to be discussing these very issues as the uh, Derek Chauvin trial continues and this pandemic uh, rolls on and the impacts that it has had on income and wealth inequality and social justice inequality and all the subjects you've been talking about this past week. So I'm happy to lend whatever word I can to it. So to get to your first question, uh, my life and career path was completely non-directional. Uh, after I finished college, I did 
attend the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, which is a reform rabbinical school, has uh, campuses in Cincinnati, New York, Los Angeles. I, after a first year mandatory program in Jerusalem, I was in New York City to continue. And then, yes, thank you for outing me as a rabbinical dropout, uh, which I am. Uh, and then after that happened, I really was aimless. It was some of the most difficult years of my life ever since, just not knowing what I could do, what I wanted to do. I was one of those students who couldn't decide on a major. I just didn't know and didn't know and then beat myself up for it, which didn't help at all. And so if there is a message from my life story to anyone in school today and pursuing a degree in higher education is to just trust in yourself and the, you know, what was it, John Lennon who said, uh, life happens while we're busy making plans. <laughs> and so there, you know, some are on a professional path already. They know they want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a academic, uh, and that's not the case for all of us. But that doesn't mean that we don't get to have a great life too. So after I dropped out, I left New York. I moved to San Francisco, 1977 and started afresh. I think my sister may be joining us today. And yeah. it was she um, who was then at Stanford who wrote me a letter and said, get out of that dirty, cold city of New York and come to California and the San Francisco Bay Area to revivify, she said. And that's not a word you get to hear often enough, but that's what I did. Within a year, started a small business, uh, which is a sign making company, which now has computers which print out full color digital images six feet across and any length up and down and it's uh, magical technology but when I started over 40 years ago it was a uh, rollover plate it was 15th century Gutenberg technology I set cold type on tight bars and that's how I made signs and the business grew technology changed and we kept going uh, it was uh, about after six, seven, eight years of the business growing that I was able to get out of my office and I somewhat naturally gravitated to volunteering on community projects. And I found out a very dangerous thing about myself that I had a facility for fundraising, dangerous because then everyone wants you on their board of directors because no one likes to raise the money. Uh, but I did enjoy it and uh, I had a talent for it. So I started serving in the community. And by the time I was appointed by the mayor to a vacancy on the County Board of Supervisors in 1998, I could honestly say that about half my day was spent on my for-profit activities and about half my day was spent on my not-for-profit activities. And how did the mayor get to know me well enough to appoint me to a vacancy? Uh, the answer to that is short. I raised some money for him during the campaign and that's how we met. Uh, and then overnight, my community service became public service. I was even ambivalent about accepting the, the maybe possible potential of the appointment because I'd never done public policy before. I did not know that I could do it well and I didn't want to very publicly fall on my face. I didn't know that I could keep my business going while putting in what amounted to about 80 hours a week at City Hall. I didn't know that I could take the political heat of which there is famously some in San Francisco. It's a blood sport. Uh, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But I also came to learn that you don't want to get between me and an idea in which I believe because I'm like a dog with a bone and I'll fight to the end for it. So with all those reservations, I jumped in. I didn't want to wake up 10 years from then and wonder what it would have been like. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. And uh, 18 years later, I was termed out of the state Senate and that ended my 18 years in, in public life and in public service. And though I'm reveling in my newly reclaimed civilian status, I loved every minute of those 18 years and it afforded me an opportunity to give back to my communities, my city, my state, which has afforded me such a great life. And at the same time, be able to learn a lot about myself and what I was capable of doing that I never would have had the opportunity 
to learn if I had not taken that step back in 1998. So with all that said, let me make a really earnest, heartfelt pitch to those who are attending today and have even the smallest inkling of getting involved in community and potentially public service, do it, pursue it, throw your heart into it. There's nothing better. It is life sustaining. It can be maddening, frustrating, uh, and all that we read about and see on television, it's not a pretty picture at times, but the redeeming point is it presents an opportunity to really roll up your sleeves and do something about the state of your world. There's a Hebrew term for it, tikkun olam, which mm -hmm. literally translates to the repair of the world. And to have even just a small part in doing that and working with other like-minded people in the community, community leaders, advocates, advocates, activists, and fellow legislators, it's a really thrilling experience. So I want to jump in and out. First of all, thank you. And thank you for sort of teeing up the whole uh, the yeah. whole arc of your career um, to from from 90, 19, well, before 1998 for now. We were we were talking a little bit before people jumped on on um, on moving from idea to law or from policy idea to legislation. And I guess it's a two part question how what did you bring to that process like how did you uh to, to the process of of creating the legislation working with others compromising to the final success and you could situate this in either the at the at the city level or or the state level sure you know after all these decades if you were to ask me in one sentence to define what it is a legislator does i would say Legislators are salespeople of ideas. Imagine a little old Jewish man pushing a cart down the street saying, who will take my ideas? <laughs> I've got ideas. And think about it. That's actually what a legislator does because any legislator at the county level, state level, national level, who can put an idea, and I'm talking about issues related to affordable housing or universal health care reform, uh, criminal justice reform, solar and renewable energies, tenancy protections, endless variety of ideas, and put it into legislative form, to legal form, and then sell it to a majority of colleagues, your idea becomes law. What could be more thrilling than that? <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that when this potential appointment to the County Board of Supervisors was presented, I had no public policy experience. That is not an exaggeration. I had zero. I'd never attended a meeting of the board. I'd never watched one on television. I had no experience with it. But rather quickly, I came to realize I was a closet policy wonk. Who knew that I love public <laughs> policy? And, and it, it, it's, it's just the case. And so how ideas come, some uh, I just dreamt up myself. Uh, I read a lot and you know, just life experience, you think that ought to be a law, right? And <clears throat> Others come from the community, from activists, from advocates, and some would come from staff, and some would come from those who professionally engage in, in the capital. And I guess we call those lobbyists, uh, but like witches, not all lobbyists are the same. There are good lobbyists and there are bad lobbyists. And I only listen to the good lobbyists, <laughs> the ones who are fighting for the people, not for the corporations. And so they come from a variety of areas. And then it's the job of my staff and me to do the initial preparatory work to see what needs to be changed in state code and then what the likelihood 
of our being able to get it through. Who, who will be the opposition? What will be their oppositional arguments? Who will be there behind us to stand behind me when we're doing our press conference to announce the bill and progress of the bill? What chance have we really got? And do we want to put all our political capital into that idea and not 10 other ideas? So there's a lot of juggling, a lot of prioritizing. But over the years, and I was in Sacramento 14 years, a, a, a legislator does develop a reputation as being a champion for this or for that. And in our case, I can say honestly that uh, it was a positive reputation reputation, one of uh, success and accomplishment. So that only attracts more people to ask you if you would consider authoring their idea, their bill. So can I, because also we were talking a little bit before about staff and um, since we might have some students here that might want to be, I mean, would go in the, the more, the more uh, traditional way into sure. public, public service through a staff role. What did you look for in a staffer, both at the county level and then also in Sacramento? And did you ever hire somebody right out of school? Well, I was a, I only had two staff at the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. So when I got to Sacramento, it was like going to heaven because there was a real budget and uh, many more staff members. And my chief of staff from City Hall came with me to Sacramento, bless his heart, uprooted his life here in San Francisco to move to Sacramento, lived there full time where I went back and forth to be in the district and with constituents over the weekend. And so we had a, a real personal connection as well as a professional connection and I could trust in him completely. And he was one of the best chiefs of staff in the Capitol building. And we had our own process of hiring and interviewing and uh, he would always, of course, recognizing I was, I was the legislator, uh, I would have final word, but he, he was able to handle me in a way that he usually got the people he wanted. But uh, proof is in the pudding. And whereas a lot of members have heavy staff turnover, many people like my chief, who was with me 17 of my 18 years in public office. That's in Sacramento, great. many of my staff were with me all 14 years. And then we also had a district staff office, of course, in San Francisco. And when I represented Marin County, also a second district office in San Rafael, those staff members were with me the entire terms. No one left. So we had a really strong team. And I think it's uh, because we had the good sense to hire good people. And those good people were appreciative of the respect and allowances that we afforded them to do their work. That's fantastic. Tell us a little bit about um, some of your biggest successes or the ones that you're most proud of, or perhaps also maybe something that um, that you got through that people don't know about, but that was personally or, or uh, important to you as a legislature, either in the House or in the Senate. Sure, this is where it's going to get tricky. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to have to, we could keep going for five hours. Exactly. Talking about uh, favorite children. Uh, <laughs> because each of those little bills are my little children. And so uh, I know we've got limited time. But one bill I, I wasn't going to talk about, but now that you phrased it as you've done, that people may not know about. And just as a preface, um, I did introduce and got passed and put on our governor's desk once in 2005, once in 2007, mm -hmm. the first equal marriage rights bill in the country. No other yeah. state house had ever done that. And I have to say with a smile on my face because when I talk to students today about our equal marriage rights bill, they kind of roll their eyes because it's like, well, <laughs> why not? <laughs> but uh, it was actually a contentious issue 20 years ago, a very contentious issue. And it, uh, George W. Bush's 2003 State of the Union, uh, no, yeah, State of the Union address, uh, or 2004, then Mayor Gavin Newsom uh, was a guest of Nancy Pelosi's for the State of the Union address and was there uh, in the room when George Bush suggested that we needed an amendment to the United States Constitution to define marriage as a 
a civil contract between a man, a single man and a single woman. Nothing could be more ridiculous and waste of time and hateful and divisional than that. And uh, Gavin attributes that experience to encouraging him to begin issuing marriage licenses on February 12th, 2004 at City Hall in San Francisco, which uh, became the winter of love and the rest was history. Uh, but the day that San Francisco began issuing those marriage licenses, I introduced that bill, put it across the desk of the assembly clerk on the same day. Uh, we didn't get it across the finish line in 2004, but we did in 2005, Arnold Schwarzenegger, not knowing that we were handing him uh, history on a silver platter, vetoed it and then vetoed it again in 2007. Uh, could have changed the course of history, but he never understood his own marriage vows because we only learned years later that he impregnated the maid at the same time he impregnated his wife. So marriage vows didn't mean much to him. Uh, and then uh, authored uh, some major legislation a number of times on promoting uh, the success of solar in California and uh, worked a lot on criminal justice issues, which I hope we'll get to talk about. Uh, but there was one bill uh, that dealt with a phenomenon at the height of the dot-com boom in around uh, year 2000 or so, uh, which was causing a lot of displacement. Uh, the hot economy was just as pre-COVID, the same thing was happening here in San Francisco again with the tech boom. And people were being priced out of their homes, neighborhoods were being displaced really serious. And so we have about 12,000 of San Francisco's most vulnerably housed people in what are known as SROs, single room occupancies. These are all pre-World War II buildings. And it's just a room, no kitchen, no bathroom, nothing. It's just a room with a bathroom down the hall. And they're not very luxurious places. They're really, uh, in many cases, not kept up at well at all. But uh, the issue was the abuse of something called the Ellis Act. And the Ellis Act gives statutory right to a landlord to evict everyone in their building without cause. Even if you're paying your rent on time, even if you're a good tenant causing no one troubles, you could lose your home in an instant by the Ellis Act. And there was, and, and people, thousands of people were losing their homes, but there was the risk that owners of these SRO buildings, which might have 50, 100, 200 units in them, could wholesale evict their whole building with the hopes of using that property for a higher financial return. So I authored a bill, advocates from San Francisco came to my office and asked if I would exempt SROs from the Ellis Act, thereby protecting 12,000 of our most vulnerably housed in San Francisco. We were at risk of seeing our homeless population increase by that amount if we hadn't done something. And I was more than happy to author the bill. And the, what you have to know to understand the story is the mighty muscle and power of the real estate and the apartment interests in Sacramento. They give a lot of money to campaigns. They like, they expect to get their way. They often get their way. And so no one really thought that this was a bill that could be passed. This was my first year in the assembly and I had no history of knowing what could pass or what couldn't. We got it to the assembly floor and uh, I had done a count of my Democratic colleagues in a caucus to make sure that I had a simple majority vote, which was 41 out of 80. And I thought I had counted 80, I had counted 41. And unfortunately, though protecting vulnerable people from homelessness should not be a partisan issue, unfortunately, uh, we didn't expect any Republicans to vote for it. So I had my 41 now. It's, Better to go to the floor with 42 or 43, just in case for uh, the double cross and the double double cross. Uh, the vote was taken. We vote electronically in the assembly, not by voice. 
and lights go up on a wall, a vote count wall, and we froze at 40. And so I checked my list very quickly. Where was my 41st vote? Went over to my Bay Area colleague. I had down as an I. And he turned to me and said, Mark, I'd really like to support your bill, but I'm sorry I can't. And I said, but Joe, when I counted our votes in caucus, I, I had you down for an I. And he said, well, if you think back clearly, you may remember I left the room. I had to leave the room right at that time. And so I never did give you my word. If I had given you my word, I'd be good for it, but I had not. And I cannot and won't vote for this bill. So I didn't have a plan B. But then, uh, so th there was a call on the bill, meaning they went into other businesses. I rounded up my last vote. And then at the end of the meeting, uh, the call was lifted and uh, the gavel was going to go down. Did I have more than 40 or just 40? Would the bill pass or wouldn't it? And from out of the heavens, a 41st vote appeared and the bill passed. And that wow. was very thrilling, obviously. Uh, and who was it that cast that 41st I was, vote? Yeah, who? A Republican colleague. It directly the opposite end of the room. I was in the far back right corner. He was in the front left corner. So I had to cross the entire room, go over to him. And of course, first of all, said, thank you so much for your vote. And he was nonplussed and shrugged his shoulders. And I said, if you don't mind my asking, how is it that you voted for this bill since none of your other Republican colleagues did? And he said, it's no big deal. When I was five years old and my parents had separated, my sisters and I were living with my mother in a single room occupancy. And the idea of having young children and a single mother kicked to the street for no good reason is not something I could support. So I'm happy to have voted for your bill. So I learned two important le lessons that day as a new legislator. Number one, never, never assume that just because someone is a fellow Bay Area Democratic colleague, he's going to vote for my bill. And also second lesson, don't presume that just because someone is a Republican colleague that he won't or she won't vote for your bill. So I learned my lesson. We did get it through the Senate and Ray Davis did sign it into law. And so um, those units are now protected from the Ellis Act. So that, that was a, a thrilling success, wow. yeah. That's fantastic. And that is, a, a, I would say, not one of the headline stories, no, no, but a, a really meaningful, <laughs> yeah, a really meaningful story about getting things done and not expecting and working on both sides of the aisle. So yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask a little bit about the Grayton bill? Because Greg brought it up on, um, sure. on and for those who weren't here, um, our colleague, uh, Greg Saris, who's the endowed professorship of, of uh, the Great Federated Indians of Great Rancheria, endowed professor of Native American Studies here at Sonoma State. Um, and we're really glad to have uh, a robust relationship with, a, with our local tribe and the idea that um, rather than having, you know, simple land acknowledgments, as is so common and as is so welcome with institutions around the country, to actually have an engaged, close relationship um, with the local tribes and to be to have that um, engagement be part of our curriculum and part of who we are at Sonoma State. And you're, you played a key role, Greg said, in, uh, in getting the bill passed that reestablished uh, the tribe. I really enjoyed being a part of Greg's presentation. Was that Monday? I think the Monday, yeah. yeah. And he, he's such a brilliant fellow and so accomplished, so successful in everything that he touches in his long mm -hmm. career. Uh, I knew him about 25 years ago at a dinner party in Los Angeles. Some friends mm -hmm. put us together. He was writing screenplays and uh, producing movies with Robert Redford, among other. <laughs> And then, of course, he was also writing books and poetry. And then uh, years after that, was reunited with his own tribe. And his personal background is so fascinating. There's some Jewish blood in his, in his mm -hmm. family as well. <clears throat> 
And so he took that on and of course has made it into a major success. Now, most of the editorial boards in the major newspapers in the Bay Area are opposed to the voter approved expansion of gambling in the area that is encroaching upon urban areas and that there are a lot of downsides to these casinos. I'm not a gambler myself. I, I don't really frequent the casinos, but I know that they create a lot of jobs and that I am a libertarian of sorts that adults should be able to do what they wanna do. It's not impacting someone else. And also of course, there is the dark side of it, just like there's a dark side to social drinking, uh, which is also legal. The downside to legal cigarette smoking. We know all these vices uh, have their dark sides. In any case, um, I did represent Marin County at that point and the Southern part of Sonoma County and in the area where the casino was then proposed. So uh, it's a little convoluted, but I'll uh, keep it short. Uh, the process is a negotiation between the tribe and the governor. And again, this was all passed by voters some years ago, about 20 years ago, and they come up with a compact. And that compact lays out exactly all the details of the development of the casino and what take the state may get of it and whatever other rules that the governor wants to be able to get from the tribe in their pursuit of the compact so they can proceed with the development of the casino, which of course the reason for it and why voters supported it was to give indigenous people an opportunity to become self-sufficient with a revenue source. And so whether one likes that revenue source or not, it, it's an opportunity and some tribes use it better than others. I knew Greg well enough and trusted him enough and believed him 100% when he laid out to me what was in the compact, that it was historic by design, that it provides the workers of the casino and now hotel and restaurant and the entire complex with uh, more than minimum wage. Um, and, and let me say, I also was the author of the $15 an hour California minimum wage, uh, which his employees are far above with full and as he says, gold plated healthcare plans and pension plans. And there's revenue sharing with all of the cities of Southern Mar Northern Marin and Southern Sonoma, which are impacted by the fact of the casino and has provided great amounts of money to them for their own purposes. And so, and is environmentally sensitive. It is brilliant by design and in execution. And he has been true to his word every step of the way. So I was in a unique position at the time. Yes, I represented the geographic areas I've just mentioned, but I also, due to the redistricting process of 2010, uh, next time I ran, I would be running for re-election to the Senate in a district that did not include Marin or Sonoma. It would just be all of San Francisco and a little bit of San Mateo counties. So whereas all of my regional colleagues who were going to be voting on that bill would have to face their constituents, many of whom were very vocal in their opposition, to the fact of the casino and did not want it to happen. It did not want the compact approved. Uh, I did not have to face those orders again. So as I said, in a unique position uh, and was more than pleased and proud to tell Greg, I would present it on the Senate floor and I would sell it to my colleagues because I believe fully in him and what he was trying to do for his tribe and for the surrounding areas. And now, what are we over a decade later yeah uh, seeing that everything he said has come true and he it's been a major success thank you for that that's yeah. it's, uh, it's a it's a great story and it's important to us so thank you i, I um, think can i jump in yeah i please. just want to uh be able to share one story relative to criminal justice reform uh, because that is i think one of the top issues of the day uh, what we saw happen in the streets of this country all last summer uh, through the leadership of Black Lives Matter, among others, 
uh, we really begin, we've really begun to address some of the systemic racism, the inherent injustice in our system. Uh, I, let me recommend to those with us today, if you haven't read a book by Brian Stevenson called Just Mercy, uh, I highly recommend it. And a movie has been made of that book. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. You could also, if you only have 18 minutes, uh, go to YouTube and watch Brian Stevenson's TED Talk, which is extraordinary. And I'm told he received the longest standing ovation of any TED presenter ever. So that says a lot right there. Uh, so issue of the day, uh, when I was in my earlier years in the Senate around 2010 or so, a three judge panel told the state of California that we had to reduce our prison population, which had ballooned to almost 200% of capacity to no more than 137% of capacity, or they would do it for us. 137.5. Thank you. 137.5. <laughs> I'm here in the prisoner's rights litigator, so I was excited for hearing this. Yes. Yeah, so we had to do something. And these are very sensitive issues, of course, because the victims of crime are very dismayed to see the perpetrators of those crimes let out. And of course, there's concern of a Willie Horton type story where someone who's let out commits some horrific crime. And so there's risk to public safety. And at the same time, the conditions within the prison system with 200% capacity or near that amount is considered cruel and unusual punishment, which is unconstitutional, which is why the judges stepped in. So it was out of control and there were a variety of ways to address this, uh, all of them with their own problems. But uh, one of the ways I addressed it was on the front end, which was to author a bill, which was SB 678. And I do not know the numbers of all my bills, hardly, uh, but that one stays with me because it's an easy number to remember. And that's uh, how it's now known and is somewhat uh, well-regarded in, in, in Sacramento for reasons I'll share with you. It's also known as uh, community corrections. And it deals with a segment of our inmate population uh, who are called, actually they're in our county jail system, not our, in our state prison system. And that's the point of it. Uh, they're called felony probationers. Now, what is a felony probationer? Uh, somewhat of a uh, confusing uh, title because uh, felony indicates a serious crime, more serious than misdemeanor, and would have a penalty of a year or more in state prison, whereas a misdemeanor is usually no more than 12 months in county jail. So if we could keep, but you would be a felony probationer uh, if you were maybe a first time offender or a young offender and the crime wasn't so serious and the judge and the court decided that rather than on your first offense, send you off to state prison, which could not take you, uh, in any safe manner uh, and could change your life forever by having spent time there as a felon, that uh, we would keep you in the county and you do some time in county jail and then you would be on probation with terms of probation. But because we weren't investing in the probation, providing the job training, the job placement, the literacy skills, all that can keep someone successful in probation, we weren't investing in that. Probation officers had the mindset that every one of their probationers would likely sooner or later reoffend and then go off to state prison. So the idea was this, to the degree that county probationers, probation officers could keep their probationers successful through these programs that the state would help invest in, which they'd never done before, 
we would have win, win, win. If they didn't reoffend, that means they didn't go to state prison. That means we wouldn't have an exacerbation of our state prison population. By definition, it would mean we have safer communities. A, 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 another offense would not occur. And this young life would have a greater chance of succeeding without a felony on his or her record, mostly he, mostly men, and uh, all that goes with a, felon, a felony conviction. Keep in mind, with a felony conviction on your record, this is what your future looks like. When you, after you've served your time for your crime, with a felony conviction, you can't even live with your mother if she's receiving any government support for her housing. You'll never get a higher education because you'll never get a Pell Grant, you'll never get a Cal Grant, you are not eligible with a felony on your record. And if you can get a job, it will likely be minimum wage for the rest of your life. So by convicting more and more people of felonies, we are creating a chronic underclass population. And of course I have task. And this is what I ask my colleagues when I ask for their vote, who benefits from our perpetuating a chronic underclass of people, nobody. So to the degree that the counties could keep their felony probationers successful, we prevent more crime, and we, the state, would share 50% of our savings with the counties, because we, the state, will save money for every felon or felony conviction that doesn't come to state prison. It's now up to about, and you correct me, $80,000 a year uh, for a state inmate. $80,000 a year we'd save. Uh, multiply that by 10,000 inmates or so. You're talking about real money for the state. We share half of that with the counties so they can continue to invest in the successful programs that have benefited these felony probationers. So it wasn't a new concept when I picked it up, but the state had never had the political will to invest the $40 million upfront money that was necessary to get this thing rolling because of course the counties needed money to invest in these programs to be able to have their success. And where did we get that money? This is around 2010. It was from the American Recovery and it was our money, A-R-R-A, -R -R uh, that uh, President Obama got through in his first year. And so it, we uh, had, California had about $40 million earmarked for public safety. I co-authored this bill with a Republican colleague of mine, John Benoit from Riverside County, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, but a great guy. Very different politics than mine, but he agreed that this was a good idea. We worked on it together and it passed with broad bipartisan support, I think nearly unanimously. And we can now document that within the first year or two, we did keep upwards of five, 6,000 felony probationers from coming into the state prison system at a time when the court was telling us we had to reduce our population by tens of thousands and saved nearly a half billion dollars by doing so. So this was a big victory. And, and to this day, I was just in Sacramento a few months ago at the state convention of county probation officers and they asked me to come and talk about what happened 10 years ago because they're still cheering it today and it's changed the way they do their business. And one of the things I remember so clearly from that experience was a, a county probation officer telling me that not only did you save us all a lot of money and our community is a lot of crime and a lot of young people, their futures, but our probation officers now go to work every day not thinking, when is this guy gonna fail, but how long are we keeping him successful? And it's a completely new mental perspective for the probation officers themselves, rather than assuming failure, they assume success. 
And I'm going to jump in here because we're at our time to open it up for Q&A. So I got my little criminal justice reform story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was going to tee you up and you did it right there. So that <laughs> was you. fantastic. I'm Thanks. so glad. I was waiting to ask the first question about it, but then you you got it in. I guess I'll, I'll ask the first question. I haven't been asking questions this week. I've been hiding in the background. But since we ended with that, sure. you made the connection about current movements for um, justice, movements against racialized social control, carceral control, in the beginning, and that's really grounding some of your thinking now. I'm wondering what, from the perspective of a former legislator, you think some interventions um, could be about divestment. Uh, there's a lot of calls for defund the police, right? Or justice reinvestment. We're seeing some things happen legislatively or through initiatives like in Los Angeles where voters allocated budget away from police, but then the policymakers aren't actually reallocating that budget. Um, and I'm wondering what you think uh, some um, legislative interventions could be uh, around those specific demands. Great question. I'm going to pick up on your use of justice reinvestment because the, the words we use really matter a lot. And I think Democrats have not served themselves well by allowing the term uh, defund police get used because that only shakes the average taxpayer and makes them nervous. They don't understand what that means. And it's not really what this is about. It is about justice reinvestment and investing in the very programs I just discussed with community uh, SB 678. Uh, we want to provide all the services as necessary. And of course, anyone who knows much about criminal justice knows that uh, we can't just start investing in high school students. We've got to back it up to middle school and to elementary school. And we know that from those proponents of first five investments that so many formative elements of human development occur in those first five years and, and the uh, achievement gap begins then. So we can't invest early enough in our human infrastructure since we're talking about infrastructure this week. And Joe Biden wants to talk about human infrastructure, not just roads and bridges. And the Republicans wanna push back and say, that's not infrastructure. Well, guess what? Uh, highways weren't infrastructure when President Eisenhower built the uh, freeway system across the country. So let's watch the words we use. Also, and there was a great editorial in the Sunday Times this last week, Frank Brunei, that uh, we shouldn't be talking about gun control anymore. It's gun safety. Uh, control doesn't get us anywhere with people and no one wants to be controlled by their government. And it's not about control, it's about thoughtful gun safety legislation. Uh, and then we have to be conscious of what we've already accomplished. Uh, Prop 49 was approved by 60% of California voters in 2014. And what Prop, excuse me, Prop 47, and what Prop 47 did was to redefine certain low level property crimes, check writing, car break-ins, other property crimes, uh, grand theft below a certain amount as misdemeanors, along with uh, all possession of all drugs uh, would be considered misdemeanors, not felonies. And I've already told you what happens when someone has a felony on his or her record, it can destroy their future entirely. And why would we wanna do that? Uh, so let's, we know we can't lock up ourselves out of our, our public safety challenges. Uh, we can't build enough prisons. We can't destroy enough families and lock enough fathers and some mothers up uh, to solve the problem. We, tried that for decades. It hasn't worked. War on drug hasn't, wars, the war on drugs hasn't worked. And so we're trying different approaches now. 
And there's been an assault by law enforcement on Prop 47 ever since it's passed. And now we're seeing some progressive district uh, attorney general, <laughs> district, district attorneys All in counties uh, in San Francisco, it, potentially in Los Angeles, uh, with recall attempts because over the past year through the COVID lockdown, there have been an increase in car break-ins and home break-ins, uh, even in my neighborhood here in San Francisco. And that upsets everybody. It's a horrible thing to experience, but to blame it on Prop 47 is just nonsense. They, of course, want to point a finger. They want to believe that if only one thing had changed, uh, these crimes wouldn't be occurring. That's not the case. Again, those who know about criminal justice issues will definitively unequivocally state that crime trends can only be looked at over a period of five or 10 or 20 years, not 12 months. Uh, there are too many possible real causes for this. And of course, there's a big difference between correlation, meaning this happened in this time period, so clearly this is the problem, and causation, what actually caused it. And there are usually multiple causes, not any one, but COVID has impacted us in many ways, has it impacted uh, crime rates. But if you wanna look at crime trends currently, the state and here in San Francisco, we're at 30 year lows in terms of rape and murder and violent crime. Yes, there has been an uptick. In and incarceration rates. And incarceration rates, yes. So we can lower prison rates and lower crime rates at the same time if we are reinvesting uh, appropriately. Well, I think and, one of the nuances I would add is in, in asking a question about the legislative position, you know, these attacks are coming on Prop 47, Prop 36, Prop 57, and those are voter initiatives where the voters mandate something, but often they're not funded. So all these resentencing efforts, like you mentioned, the drug resentencing or the petty offenses, you know, uh, it, being involved in, in litigating resentencing myself, it's hard because the public defenders don't get funded, other offices don't get funded to provide these hundreds of thousands of, um, of, case, of people needing cases, these services. And now these DA attacks are being done on penal code related issues, not um, ballot initiative, you know, so there are legislators now to attack with, for example, SB 10 with bail, or what's going on with penal code section 1170 right now with Gascon, he's getting sued. And there's lots of critiques from law enforcement unions and from people within the DA's office. And I think you're, you mentioned recall campaigns, but there's also initiatives uh, through suits to block implementation of some, oh, well, prop Prop 66 and death penalty as well. So I think it's really interesting to look at the locus of investment when voters try to get something done that the legislature couldn't get done, but then don't have money to go with it. It's open to attack by these um, law enforcement unions or, or other interests to, to kind of undermine. So right. um, before we move on to a, a next question, I just want to say that before Prop 47 made its way to the ballot, I authored it two consecutive years as legislation in Sacramento, wow. unsuccessfully. The first year uh, we did, as Prop 47 does, redefine these crimes I've mentioned from felony to misdemeanor. Uh, but in our second attempt, I compromised in hopes to get it through. And so rather than take the step of felony to misdemeanor, we took a mid-step felony to wobbler, and that's a term of art. A wobbler gives the district attorneys in the counties the authority, depending on the specifics of the case, to charge it either as a felony or as a misdemeanor. And I couldn't get that through either. Uh, oh, actually, we did get that through, and then law enforcement lobbied the governor, Governor Brown, to veto that. The compromise, and he vetoed the compromise. And because of that, they got felony to misdemeanor once 60% of the voters said, yes, let's do that. So they could have had a compromise if they hadn't been so ardent in their opposition. So we have Next question. Left. We have time for another? 
Yeah, you go ahead, Caitlin, if you want to call on, I because we'd love to hear from some students, um, uh, some of the students here. If not, we've got other ones lined up, but I always want to in, encourage students first. I know you're looking like you have one, maybe, Tanya. Tiffany, Julissa, Tanya. Um, I don't have a question, more so of a comment. Just I really appreciate you being here and just hearing about your life story and how you got into policy work has been really interesting because it's something that I'm sort of interested in pursuing. I just don't really know how to get there. Um, I'm trying to like figure that out because I'm graduating this semester, but um, I just I'm really grateful for you and um, I really appreciate you being here. I like those kind of comments. Thank you. That's very gracious of you. And if you'd like to contact uh, Dean Robbins, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you uh, personally about it because again, anyone who's interested, I want to encourage to move in this direction. It's such exciting and important work. And I think, thank you. And uh, we will make that happen. And that seems yeah. like a good place to, to actually toss it to Jamie, who I know was sitting, uh, had, had a front row seat to your journey. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that I'll put in the chat for after Jamie. Okay, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, um, you know, apropos of um, what um, so the student's name just said, um, I did have a front row seat being Mark's sister, but I'm going to speak also as a um, constituent, as a citizen, and um, uh, and just you know, kind of a view on how do you get to be a legislator? Um, as Mark said, he. He was a sign maker and our father wanted to write a book called From Sign Maker to Lawmaker. <laughs> and they kind of, how did that happen? Uh, what was really interesting, I think, to me and to all of us was to see that, uh, as Mark said, he didn't really have legislative experience. But once he was in office, it was like, wow, I realized that uh, you could have a talent for legislating. I mean, I'm an athlete, right? So I have an athletic talent, but who knew you could have you know, business talent. You could actually have a talent for that. And, you know, it's negotiating skills. Uh, he had Republican colleagues who would call him uh, uh, his bookend, his or her bookend, uh, which was really something. I remember Mark was on the Bill O'Reilly show, or Factor, if you remember that, it was like the extreme right wing. And Riley O'Reilly never respected anybody. And he did say at the end of that, Senator, I disagree with you, but I do respect you, which was amazing. And I think that's because Mark has, again, I'm not just being a prejudiced sister here. Mark has really embodied um, both uh, a great mind, um, just voracious interest in the issues and reading and educating himself. I always felt his IQ went up about 100 points in office. Um, and, but the other part is the heart. And you know, we think politics is about power, but politics is really about policy. And Mark was very aware uh, to this day, as you can hear in all of the examples, that um, you know, being a legislator, or a lawmaker, or being in politics is really about policy, which is about people. And that is that everything that you do is is affecting people's lives. And so marketing has always had that kind of empathy and really listen. You know, people come to hearings and they come with their and they write. With their concerns, uh, whether they're very local, uh, right where they live, it could be on another level. And really knowing that policy making is about the people and never forgetting that. So I think that that combination of head and heart is extremely important. And I can also tell you this, Mark uh, spoke at a conference, I practice uh, the art of Aikido. He was a, we had him be a, um, our, sort of the, the Aiki of politics. How do you find harmony? How do you resolve conflict in a way that can be win-win. And Mark was a great speaker for that. Everyone was like, what are you running for? Can I vote for you? And I don't care what it is. And I think that we don't have enough um, leaders, politicians who remember that they're not just politicians and it's just gotten worse through the years in, in the very recent years. Um, so that, you know, to, to really think about how much we need leaders um, like Mark, that Mark I think has been a great example and model of um, to, you know, to, to find ways to work together and to make a difference on issues that make a difference in everybody's lives. So I just wanted to share some of those Thank things. I'm um, having a front row seat. And again, Thank not, you, not just as a prejudiced <laughs> sister, but uh, it, it's just true, you know, and I, I'm telling Mark, you know, in his, uh, since he's been turned out, like my, I, I, I want him to be mentoring. Um, if I was going to create a job for him or a place that would be to mentor 
uh, people, uh, staff people, as leaders and as candidates. Uh, <clears throat> we will try how, to make do that. We yeah. will try to make that happen. And I know we we're coming. Make that to, happen. We yes. will make that happen. Thank you. <laughs> we and need more marks. <laughs> exactly. We're coming to the end of our time. There's one small question, and maybe you can take us out with this question, which is about social media. Um, and whether that has changed. That's a little bit too much for one minute, but uh, first of all, just thank you. It's been a joy, thank you. Uh, as you can tell, I really enjoy talking about our legislative work because it was so exciting and, and so important. Uh, social media, keep in mind, I was turned out of the Senate in 2016, so five years ago, uh, wasn't then what it is now. I had a handful of colleagues at the time who were making use of Twitter and mm -hmm. very clever in their own self-promotion in that they could say something uh, pithy and memorable on Twitter and then a reporter would pick up on it and then it was a printed story and maybe he got to a television interview as a part of it. He's now in the House of Representatives and I see him on MSNBC. So he's still up to what he's so good at uh, and, and that's part of the job too. Self-promotion is part of the job uh, and he gets his voice heard. Uh, my staff and I would have to laugh at the time because before we put out a press release, 10 sets of eyeballs would review it. We would wordsmith it to death and it would be very forethoughtful before it went out. The idea that I would pick up my phone and just let words come out of my mouth and share it with the world, it would make my chief of staff pass out. <laughs> so I, think, I, I never really mastered social media. <laughs> and probably, it, which is why you've been such a success. And I think if, when we get you mentoring, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> to mentor, to get off social media, and 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 uh, have substantial communication with your constituents would, as you have done, would be great. So thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, students, for being here and guests. If everybody wants to give Mark a, a big Zoom round of applause, um, and do you want to close this out by t having this on the um, website, Caitlin? And thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, uh, student organizers, too. And I just posted the survey. If you can give us some feedback, we rely on the school to fund us, and we have to give them some information. And we also ask how we can improve this event. So it's been going since 2015. We want it to keep going. So please fill out the survey and let us know how to improve it. And thank you all so much for this great session. And I thank all of you. It's really been terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Good.